So they asked me to talk about some of our recent investigations. And part of the purpose of this, we like to help folks avoid issues before they become the issue and stuff like that. There's all sorts of things. Just to give you an idea of what we do, there's about a thousand local governmental entities all throughout the state. So uh, 29 counties, uh, 245, 46. I can't remember the last number for cities and towns. It's 247. And uh, we've got 41 school districts, about 130 charter schools, and we've got about 500 districts. So big districts like UTA, small districts, think cemetery districts, irrigation districts, and everywhere in between. And they all struggle uh, and deal with different issues and stuff. And so part of my presentation is just walking you through some of the experiences we've had across the state. So you can then go back to your organizations and to evaluate your circumstances to try and mitigate the problems that you have because every organization will have different challenges. A uh, very first thing that I'd like to point out to you is to pick qualified legal counsel. We dealt with a water district in Utah County several years ago. And um, the interesting thing is, um, as many of you know, you have a requirement to submit your budgets to my office, your end of year financial reports. We train the CPA firms that audit you. And we had uh, various entities that were delinquent in their reports. And one of the key things is we were trying to work with them to become compliant, but there was a certain point in time where we just issued a press release for the 50 remaining entities that still had not become compliant over the previous year to, to out them, to bring some uh, uh, pressure to them from their constituency to become compliant. And so I live in Utah County, and the local press down there went and interviewed this uh, water district. And they responded, well, if the state auditor would turn on his fax machine, he'd get our reports because we're doing everything right and he screwed up. And so you can imagine how we took that in the office given that this district had a long history of being delinquent. So we sent him a, a notice, said you have seven days to produce this information, 30 days to produce some other information and we're going to come in and audit you. Well lo and behold as we were doing part of that audit, we found out the week before we issued this press release they had drained ha half their bank account in one day they had cut a check for $192,000 to their board chair. $192,000. Okay? $80,000 to their board vice chair, $15,000 to another board member, and, and, and stuff like that. Now, according to state law, you can't pay more than $5,000 in total compensation to a district board member. So you do the math. $5,000, even those that are poor at math, $192,000 is a lot more than $5,000. Okay? So uh, I sent them a uh, nasty gram, basically said, I deem those illegal payments and you got seven days to pay it back or I'm going to come pursue uh, civil remedies and turn it over to the AG's office for criminal prosecution. And within about 10 days, we had recovered all the money. The interesting dynamic is their excuse was, well, we had relied on our legal counsel. Okay? Their legal counsel at the time in this situation was a retirement planner was not somebody that understood governmental laws, was a financial planner. So the first lesson is rely on capable, competent legal counsel in your activities. Be very careful if you're getting legal advice from an individual or an organization that doesn't know the type of activities that you engage in and doesn't understand governmental activities. Any questions there? The interesting thing is for this organization, if they hadn't thumbed their nose at me, it would have been likely another year before we even knew what took place. And maybe we wouldn't have been able to recover it. But given what had happened, it was only a few weeks later that we identified those excessive payments. We were able to recover all that money. But can you imagine draining half your bank account in one day with illegal payments to board members? Next thing, uh, too often we run into uh, boards that are asleep at the wheel. They basically wash their hands, turn everything over to, to management to run everything, and don't pay attention. So unfortunately, we had another issue in Utah County, an irrigation district. And um, according to state law, except for very rare circumstances, if you don't have a budget, you can't spend money. And so this irrigation district had not submitted a budget. And so we sent them off a notice saying, until you adopt a budget, you may not spend money. And then we did something new in the office. Uh, you know, as, as you heard, I'm relatively new in the office, been there just over four years. Uh, we subpoenaed their bank records because I wanted to see if they violated my order. 
And sure enough, the finance director, the day after she signed my order, receipt of the certified mail, she wrote a check to herself. Okay, the day after. Now this is not a large organization in which somebody signed for the mail and somebody else didn't quite get the memo yet. This is basically a one person operation. Well, when we subpoenaed the bank records, we started noticing, hi Charlie, how are you? Uh, do you have your hall pass? Um, Charlie's a good friend of mine. We go back, what, 10 years? A long, a long time. So, but in this, uh, in this case, when we subpoenaed those bank records, we found certain transactions that looked questionable to us. So ultimately, we ended up subpoenaing seven years of bank records. We identified from our perspective that this individual had stolen over $106,000, okay? Over about a seven year period of time. Now, to help you understand the size and scope, this is about 15% of their budget. 15%. This isn't like the state. There's a $15 billion budget and somebody took a thousand bucks and you just don't see it because it's such a rounding error. This was 15% of the budget. Okay? Unfortunately, the board was not really reviewing financial reports, was not reviewing bank statements, was not signing the checks. They had basically turned everything over to the finance director. We trust her. Okay, we trust everything she does. And she was stealing them blind, okay? My team went to go meet with her. We first met with the board chair and the water master, and they were just like, no, you guys are wrong. This can't be the case. No, she'd never do something like that. They went to meet with her, and she started admitting to, to the theft. One of the key triggers was uh, there were a lot of checks written out to Chase. Okay, if you see checks written out to Chase, what would you assume? Credit card, absolutely. Now the interesting thing is this district did not have any credit cards. So right there, there's a warning sign. Why are you writing checks to Chase when you have no credit card in the organization? We also found payments to her and payments to her company that were adding up to more than the agreed upon amount that they were supposed to be paying monthly for her services, okay? So they got to the point in the interview where my team just said, why don't you add up what you think you took, let us know in the morning what your number is. And my, my guys never said what our number was. It was a little over 106,000, but they didn't tell her that number. The next morning, about eight o'clock, she contacted my office, talked to my folks, and said, I think I took over $103,000, which was really close to our number. So that's the number we went to the county attorney with, and she was prosecuted, pled guilty, and they recovered that money and stuff. And so this is one of those things from my perspective. If the board would have periodically checked financial statements, looked at the bank statements that were the, there. If they would have been signing the checks, just certain basic financial activities, they would have easily prevented or detected what was taking place. Instead, they were out of the loop. They were not engaged at all. From their perspective, as long as water was go going down the ditch, things were good. Everything was working. So just recognize, and that's not the only example of uh, boards being, if you will, asleep at the switch. Um, it's important to separate your key duties. And some of you are small and you can't always separate the duties. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But separating duties is you don't want somebody receiving money, running the accounting system, cutting the checks, making the deposits, everything else like that. You do not want a situation like that. Um, you may have heard about Kane County. I got a call on a Saturday night. It was about 6 o'clock. I was driving down to UVU for a dinner. And, uh, I got a call from the commission chair for Kane County. And he goes, I got a call from the bank and they think that our treasurer is stealing money. They said something about money getting transferred out of one of her public accounts into a personal account. Can you help us? What do we do? And I said, well, it's, it's Saturday night, bank's closed. Clearly we can't do anything tonight. But be in the bank, eight o'clock Monday morning. So we had a conference call uh, with the bank management, commissioning chair and myself, 8.30 I started issuing a subpoena to the bank. By 9.30 they started producing records to my office. By 5, 5.30 we had clear indication that she was transferring over a two year period of time from multiple public accounts that she was exclusively the person in control of those accounts over to multiple personal accounts. Sent a, sent a notice off to the, the sheriff to serve on her basically saying you may not access public accounts you may not disperse public funds until we complete our audit. 
and stuff. Basically, blocking her out of uh, serving in that function, those duties, just because of the risk that we had. Um, at the end of the day, what we identified was over $34,000 she had transferred into personal accounts. We identified another $58,000 of cash that she was the custodian of that was missing. Records had been altered and other things like that, but that had gone missing. Plus another about $1,400 of a cell phone charge. Now, the county paid her cell phone bills, so this other $1,400 charge was, was clearly unauthorized. But this is one of those things where there was a lack of separation of duties. She controlled the money coming in, the money going to the bank, the checks being written out of those accounts, everything else like that. She had full control and nobody else was reviewing it. Technically, the commission was supposed to be reviewing some of those records. The clerk auditor was supposed to be reviewing others and working on the reconciliation. But because of the nature of how counties are structured and they're all separately elected officials, it was basically, you stay out of my territory, I'll stay out of yours rather than recognizing what the law said about the collaboration in terms of the oversight. And so this is one of those key things. Uh, the mayor and I, from, the mayor from Price, were just talking about the challenges in a small organization of separating duties. So if you can't separate duties, then you need to have what we call compensating controls, where there's other reviews that take place to try and detect and mitigate what's going on. Now, sometimes folks in your organization will complain about the policies and procedures that you put in place. And I tell folks, the purpose of that is not just to protect the organization. The purpose of that is also to protect the individual. We had gone in and we had audited uh, one organization. And uh, the CEO had charged $180,000 for pedicure, manicure, stuff like that. Okay? They indicated as part of the audit that was an error the money was paid back. Well, money, unfortunately, was supposedly paid back in cash. Now, what would you assume one of the problems would be if the money's paid back in cash? We don't, have a, we don't have a paper trail. If it were a check, we could see a canceled check. We could understand. We could track the canceled check to a deposit, other things like that. The cash went into petty cash. Okay? I'm not used to money going into petty cash that way. Money comes in and goes into the bank account. If you need petty cash, then you pull money out, put it in petty cash. But, so there's no way. So from our perspective, there will always be the question, even though... She will say, I paid the money back. We can't prove it. We don't know. And so there's always that question. And so the purpose for policies and procedures is not just to protect the organization. It is also to protect the individuals. How many here have heard of the Utah Communications Authority? OK. An interesting dynamic there. We had just launched into an audit of that organization. We were going in to look at. Uh, governing practices, questions of how the board was governing the organization, and procurement policies. We'd heard some complaints about how they were going about certain procurements and, and allegations of steering procurements. Well, sh shortly after, like the week after we engaged in our audit there, um, uh, a person who'd been stealing from the organization for about 10 years tripped up in what they were doing, and that theft was detected about that time. Now, the interesting dynamic that took place here was here you had a secretary, highly trusted in the organization, but the secretary stole over $800,000 over a 10-year period of time. Now the interesting dynamic is all the credit cards in the organization that all the individuals had came and flowed through her. She was the keeper of all the records for credit card expenditures and everything else like that. Now what was she doing? She was altering the credit card statements. For 10 years, she was altering the statements. So the statements that were flowing through for approvals and payment were all bogus. All of them were bogus. And that's what tripped it up. She had accidentally printed the original receipt on the printer, forgot to pick it up. Somebody came along, looked at it, and said, well, I, I better take this to the accountant. The accountant looked at that and was like, well, what is that? It looks like credit card statement. That doesn't look like any of our credit card statements because that was the legitimate one and everything else was bogus. And so we tell folks it is really important to go back to source documentation. So when we come in to audit now, we'll sit down with folks and if we need to look at a credit card statement, we will have them log into the credit card company website and we will have them print out that statement. Then we can take that statement and go compare to what's in the filing cabinets 
and other things like that to, to use that as our ground truth. We'll do the same with bank statements, have them log into the bank, have them print out the bank statement. We also recommend our division of finance for the state recommends that the credit card statements do not go to the individual who has the card, but that the statement goes to the supervisor so that that person can't intercept and alter the statement before it goes to somebody else for approval to pay. Any questions there? Pretty amazing. I had somebody say, well, that's a lot of work. Why would somebody go to that much work to alter those statements? Well, do the math. At over $800,000 over 10 years, that's $80,000 a year. That's like, that's like a full-time job, and then some for some folks, just to alter credit card statements. Now, the sad thing here was, here's this person, and, and she had, she had a, a card, and she had also given a card to, I think it's her daughter. And so her daughter was charging things against the organization. And, and you know, it's, to me, it's a sad commentary when a mother gets the daughter engaged in theft as well. It's bad enough for that individual, but it's even worse. Now, one of the interesting things is my office, uh, before my time, back in 2010, had gone through to audit and identified a lack of receipts. When it came to a lot of credit card purchases, we found about a third of them were missing receipts to back up the expenditures. And so the organization put into place a new policy. They put in a log. So if you didn't have a receipt, either you lost it or it wasn't given, you would enter that in the log, who it was, what the amount was, why you didn't have the receipt, lost or not given, you know, and, and stuff like that. Well, the interesting thing was, who do you think was in charge of keeping tra track of the log? The secretary, okay? The secretary who was stealing money. Number two, when we went back later as part of our audit, um, only part of this uh, log was being kept. The amount and where the purchase was from was on there, but you know what was missing? the name of who had lost it, okay? And I think, if I remember right, about half of those things were, were tied back to the secretary, but the name was not kept track of because then nobody could look and see, well, why is so-and-so losing so many receipts? I mean, this is crazy that she, half the receipts that are missing are hers. So this is one of those examples of where you can put in place good policies, but they don't necessarily translate into action. So you've got to make sure what policies you put in place are actually being followed by your organization. And this was a case where they put in place a really good policy, but then nobody followed up to make sure it was taking place. The interesting thing is after my office had identified uh, the lack of receipts, um, the next year they only came back to track one transaction through the organization. And because that all seemed to flow right, they assumed everything else was right and didn't go back to check the other problem. And then in other years, private a private firm had done the auditing, and because the credit cards were viewed as a low risk to material misstatement of the bank statements, they didn't even look at the credit cards. And so this had been missed on multiple fronts. Similarly, we had another uh, organization where the CFO for the organization, uh, they had a theft, things getting charged against his card. And we went in there, and in the interviews with him, he said, I always maintain access to my card. I always maintain control of my card. Well, he has shared the numbers with people in his organization, like the human resources director, okay? You guys know how a credit card works. Does holding that plastic matter much if you share the number with somebody else? So what took place in this organization was the human resource director started charging things on his card. Online purchases for video games, other things like that, okay? Um, I can't remember the amount, but it was over $50,000, okay? Then she'd get the credit card statement. She wasn't as sophisticated with Photoshop and other things like that. She would just cut out the middle of the credit card statement, tape it back together. So a two-page two statement would turn into a half a page statement. And so he'd look at his statement and, oh, it looked fine. I don't know why he didn't question these black lines that were kind of going across where the cuts had taken place, but he's looking at that photocopy thing and going, yeah, those look like my purchases and signing off. And, being oblivious to what else was going on. Okay, just right under, and he's the finance guy, okay? Sometimes you understand folks that don't understand numbers and things like that. He's the finance guy. He's in charge of this type of stuff. Um, and so that's one of those where you're just, you're just kind of sloppy. And in his mind, he didn't understand. When I start sharing that number, 
somebody can keep that number. They can start using that number somewhere else. And he was oblivious to what was taking place. And he was not going back to source documentation. He was just trusting whatever came through the process. You see, unfortunately, a theme that we have to deal with in organizations. Let me, let me, let me bring something up right here. It's just kind of an intermission. We talk a lot about something called the fraud triangle. Okay? When opportunity, pressure, and rationalization come together, there's a heightened risk of fraud. So let's walk through this. We went into an organization, and, and in this, this is a, a, a court clerk who was doing this theft. Um, on Monday through Thursday, the city offices were open. So the city recorder was taking the payments for the fees and fines for court. On Friday, the city offices were closed. Okay? So the payments were taking place where? At the court. Okay? So the court clerks were taking money, and as you might suppose, Lots of this was cash payment. Some of these folks are on hard times. They don't really have a bank account. They're some of the unbanked. They're paying in cash, okay? So now you have somebody who has the opportunity to take the money. Doesn't mean they will, but they have the opportunity. And opportunity is one of the few things in your organizations you can typically control, separation of duties, other things like that. That's where you can actually place certain controls to help mitigate the risk. But so now you have the opportunity. In this situation, uh, there was pressure on the family budget. In this case, it was some medical issues um, for, for a child in the family, and then I believe they were going through a divorce. So there are other financial stresses in, in the family budget. But you might think about addiction, living a lifestyle beyond your means, other things like that. There are lots of reasons to have pressure. So you can see how you have the opportunity to take the money, now you have pressure to take the money. And then when you start rationalizing, you start saying, why it's okay to take the money. In this case, when my folks approached her and started to question her, she was only about $3,000 into the theft. So it was pretty early in the scheme of things. She immediately went to her desk and she went to the glove box in her car. And what do you think she pulled out? All the receipts for the money she had taken. Because why do you think she did that? In her mind, she wasn't stealing it. She was only borrowing it and she was going to pay it back. She had rationalized why it was okay to borrow it because she was keeping track of what she was borrowing because she was going to pay it back. Now, some other folks will rationalize up, I haven't got a raise in five years. I deserve this. I do more work than Joe, yet they don't pay me like they pay Joe. I deserve it. There's lots of rationalizations. But now you can see if somebody has the opportunity to take money, they have pressures to take money, and then they start rationalizing why it's okay to take the money, you can see why there's a heightened risk of fraud, and we try and warn folks about this. Um, going back to Kane County, I was talking with the commission chair after we did our investigation there, and we were talking about the fraud triangle, and he started talking about the warning signs that they had. Um, this individual had previously had the county credit card taken away from her for misuse of the credit card. So they had past history of, of taking money. Um, when I served the notice on the sheriff, he had indicated uh, indications of financial stress in the family and stuff like that. And so they were well aware of clearly she had the opportunity, clearly there was pressure, and clearly she had rationalized in the past. But because they didn't understand these kind of concepts, they were just oblivious to it. They had an individual, a former employee, that had raised some concerns, and they had just chalked it up to a, a malcontent employee that was leaving rather than it was really something about the treasurer in that case. And so it's one of those things in your organizations, think about this. Just because all three of these situations exist doesn't mean that there's fraud. But it does mean there's a heightened risk and you need to be aware of it. And like I said, you may understand the pressures in somebody's family budget, but oftentimes you will not. And you may recognize certain uh, rationalization, but likely you will not. And so really opportunity is where you can weigh in in terms of the practices and the policies in your organizations, that's where you have the most ability to affect the detection and mitigation of the misuse of public funds. We uh, audited an organization where um, there was quite a bit of uh, improper use on the uh, personal credit cards. And in this case, what was taking place was the finance officer was really late submitting those credit card receipts for approval to the agency director, okay? And the agency director admitted that, you know, 
months would elapse, and when I finally got the stack of all the credit card receipts, I basically just signed off on them that I got them. I didn't really look through to see what was in them, because he was finally just relieved that he had them, that that was what he was focused on then, and had just been oblivious to, I really need to go through those credit card statements to look to see whether the expenditures were appropriate for our organization and whether the appropriate documentation took place. And unfortunately, we see that time and time and time again. We went into the school for the deaf and blind, and we got a tip there from the superintendent for the school, a good friend of mine, Joel Coleman, and he said, we have a, we have a former employee, and it looks like um, for about two months, she was uh, uh, getting improper payments out of the donation account. Will you come in and look and help us review what took place? So we went in there, and uh, shortly after we got in there, we expanded our scope significantly um, to not just look at the donation account, but also the, um, the general fund account where the state appropriations were coming into. And we found out that this uh, lady had charged over $60,000 improperly to credit cards. Uh, you know, Sam's Club, um, Smith's credit card, things like this. Uh, had gotten gift cards, uh, made improper purchases. You know, when you see things like, let's say, alcohol and cigarettes, you don't really think that's an appropriate expenditure for school for the deaf and blind. There were expenditures like an Xbox. We had to go back to the school and verify, do you use an Xbox in your training or not? They said, no, we don't use an Xbox. So therefore, we identified those were improper as well. The interesting dynamic, though, was um, they were just missing, missing receipts. Like, everything was gone. Four years plus of financial records were just gone. Now, from our experience, that amount of records, they don't just get misplaced. Okay. In this case, there were allegations that records were shredded. We couldn't prove that records were shredded, but clearly we identified years and years and years of records were just gone. And that's one of those interesting things. Uh, it appeared that an individual was trying to cover up the theft, so if the records weren't there, nobody's going to know. Uh, clearly, lots of records being missing causes questions. And then I have certain uh, special powers to go, if you will, recreate records. So I can go back to work with the Walmarts, the Krogers of the world, to recreate uh, spending that took place over multiple years, to recreate what activity took place on those cards so we could re reconstruct what was actually taking place. So I think the individual probably assumed free and clear, uh, but we were able to recreate many years' worth of records in terms of what actually took place on those credit cards. One of the other interesting dynamics is we see situations where the organization, in this case, the organization didn't even know the card existed. And the organization had some weak controls but got new management and had put in place good policies and procedures. And the finance director, the former finance director at this school, had assumed that this one employee over here was reconciling all the credit card statements because that was the policy. Well, it turns out the person doing the theft was the person that trained this employee. This employee was reviewing all the credit cards except for the ones she was using. And she was intercepting and, and, and paying to the side her credit cards so folks didn't even know in the organization what was taking place. She was also altering financial records and other things to cover up the expenditures she was making. But this is one of those things. Even when the organization found out about the card and they went to uh, one of the companies to get access, they didn't want to give them access to the, to the credit card because it was in the name of this employee, even though it had the name of the organization on there. And so that was one of those interesting things. We had to go in there and get those records because they weren't going to share it with the organization. We talk a lot, and I had the question earlier, who here has heard the term P card or purchase card? A few of you. So purchase cards are different than credit cards. They act very similar but they're different, okay? And you understand why you know, credit cards are convenient. You know, rather than a whole bunch of approvals and stuff like that up front, somebody can go off, make the payment, and get reimbursement, okay? But because of that, there's weak controls. You're trying to deal th with things on the back end because you don't have the controls on the front end to limit the purchases to what's appropriate. Now, you have some greater controls when it comes to purchase cards. Some of those co controls are you can put in per purchase limits, per month limits for transactions. 
You can limit them to certain vendor codes and not other vendor codes. So yes, you can go shop at office supply stores, but you can't shop at the state liquor stores, things like that. So you can limit where those cards can be used. We still think there's a lot of risk to that, but we think purchase cards are much better than credit cards. Now, one of the other things we advise folks is limit those kind of cards to those that really have a compelling need. If you're an employee that does one purchase per year and it's a small dollar purchase, it's usually better in the organization to have you just put that on your personal card and then submit for a reimbursement, submit your receipts, and then get reimbursed. If you're somebody that's a high dollar, then it's probably appropriate for you to have a quote unquote company card in those situations. But we went into one organization where if you were a full-time employee, boom, you got a card. You got a credit card, okay? And then a lot of these organizations wonder why their employees are misusing the card. Boy, they're always going out for lunch or they're never turning in their receipts. You know, interesting, anybody want to take a guess how many employees lose receipts when they put it on their own personal credit card? Like, like it never happens. Okay, for me, it was once in four years in my office, and you should have heard the hell that my secretary gave me. I basically had to go back to the restaurant and said, can you print another receipt for me? But, but in essence, we're, we're seeing time and time again, when it's the company card, the organization feels compelled to pay the bill whether or not the documentation is there. They gotta, they gotta pay it, they don't wanna have a late fee and other things like that, so they pay it. And so after the fact, they're trying to deal with these circumstances, but it's just amazing how that stuff just doesn't get turned in, but when somebody puts it on their own card, they definitely wanna get paid. They don't wanna foot the bill, so they're turning in their receipts to make sure they get reimbursed. One of the other things when we talk about understanding what's going on in your organization, um, the mayor over here, this wasn't an audit that we did of Kaysville, but this was an investigation that they did. They had a complaint about uh, something that was taking place in their organization dealing with scrap metal and uh, in their public works. And they wouldn't have found out that there was about $13,000 in cash in the safe for the public works department. And correct me if I get any of this wrong, mayor, but, but in essence, they found out even though the policy is the money needs to be deposited, everything else like this, in this case, they were selling off scrap and putting cash there and using it for you know, summer barbecues and employee recognition type activities and things like that, okay? So even though the city had a certain policy of how cash was supposed to be handled, within the organization, one department was, was violating policy and not really understanding that they were also violating state law. State law basically says you got three days to deposit the money. The other interesting thing is, is <laughs> is the news reported about the public work story in the top of the newscast. In the bottom of the newscast, they were reporting about the, how the Kaysville police were helping uh, lemonade stands, kids that had lemonade stands raising money for, for certain things in the community and how they were going to buy lemonade at these lemonade stands. And so the news report and their sponsor gave, I think it was $500 to the police to help them purchase more lemonade at lemonade stands. So you got the first story complaining about loose cash in Kaysville City, and the latter part, they're giving cash to the police chief in Kaysville City, and the mayor's like, I can't win e either way. But he said the, the police chief called him shortly after the story aired and said, Mayor, I just want you to know, I took the money to the recorder, it's been deposited, we don't have it. <laughs> but it's one of those interesting dynamics. You, you have policies in place, you think certain things are going on in your organization, but it's really hard to know what's going on and you're continually training folks in your organization. You've got low-skilled individuals that know how to do certain things but don't necessarily know why they're doing it. You've got other folks that have left. They've got lots of experience. They've left. Somebody new comes in. They don't fully know what that process is. And so it's always a, a, a challenging uh, activity within any organization. Now, do you know what spear phishing is? Spear phishing. A phishing attack is when an email is just blasted to like all of you. Um, you know, I, I got a couple this morning. I didn't know I had a relative in Nigeria that had a million dollars for me, but you know, they sent it off to me, click here, you know, and, and they would make sure to get the money to me. Okay, spear phishing is a little bit different. This is where they target you. So they look at Wayne and they know Wayne, they know who Wayne is, they know what Wayne's job is in the organization, and Wayne gets an email and it looks like it's legitimate. And so Wayne's sitting here getting this email, it looks legitimate, 
and there's just enough information, just enough pressure to cause him to do something, but not enough that, that you know, he can detect that it's, it's bogus or not enough that trips him to pick up the phone and call the mayor or something like that. So we had two situations that we're aware of. We know others were hit. Um, we know two that, that, that fell because of this spear phishing. Um, but they were both counties where the county treasurer received a spear phishing attack. It looked like it came from a commission member or commission chair. Okay, it talked about an activity that sounded like an activity that the commission was doing. And it was requesting a wire transfer. Okay, and it was urgent. We had to pay this consultant. We needed to transfer the money immediately to get this paid, yada, yada, yada. Well, in, in the first case, the treasurer responded, emailed back. So he responded back. Well, the email in the reply was a bogus email address. It wasn't going back to the commission member. It was going off to the, the spammer. But in essence, the treasurer had responded back, asked some questions, got a response back that sounded legitimate, and so he did a wire transfer. Okay? Forgot about other you know, policies and sign off of the county auditor and other things like that. Just quickly transfer the money. Trying to be conscientious, trying to meet the needs of the commission as he thought they were, and transfer the money. And in that one case, I think it was thirty-six or thirty-eight thousand dollars got transferred. In the other county, it was about forty-eight thousand dollars. Now these are both very small rural counties, so this these are big dollars for those organizations. Um, and so both of them, it, the attack was just legitimate enough that it looked good, and so that's why they responded. But it was completely bogus. Now what could have helped in these circumstances? One, picking up the phone and calling the commissioner to just verify. And, and there was questions about the receipts and, oh, I'll get you the receipts afterwards and things like that. You know, clearly getting the receipt up front would have helped in that situation. Getting a second set of eyes from the county auditor, which is required by law, but didn't take place, that could have helped mitigate. Now, it was good that both these treasurers, after this took place, quickly fessed up and said, I think I got scammed. You know, quickly realized in hindsight, something didn't quite seem right about that and fessed up so law enforcement could get engaged and stuff like that. But that's one of these things, each of us, you've probably received something that looks like it's from your credit card company or your bank that looks legitimate, okay? It's got the logo that looks the same way, it's got the color scheme that looks legitimate. We all get these kind of things and they're targeted just enough personally to us, not blasted to everybody, you know? Not everybody uses Zion's Bank. But when I get one, let's say, that says Zions Bank and has certain information, I start thinking, well, okay, maybe this is legitimate and stuff. And so you just need to be aware of things like that within your organization um, because there's lots of folks. When it comes to government, lots of information is public. If you look at counties, for example, you know who all the county elected officials are. You know the big activities that are taking place in the county. You know who the commissioners are, who the treasurer is, other things like that. So you, you get enough information that you can, you can put enough in there that looks legitimate without being so specific that you trip somebody that you don't know what's going on. So I've, I've, I've talked a lot right there. What questions do you have? Sorry, uh, the question is di difference between an irrigation district, irrigation company, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm probably not as conversant on all those details. I know for a lot of the irrigation districts, they're dealing with water going down the ditch. I know uh, in the water company we dealt with, they were really buying and selling shares of water. They weren't really putting water down a ditch or down a pipe. Well, we're part of this company, and we, uh, we've got some issues with it. Why in the case of the audit side, do you, or is it out of your hands? Yeah, so, so every governmental entity in the state is subject to audit by me. Now, oftentimes those audits are taking place with private firms working on my behalf under my delegated authority. But yeah, we, we can either you know, spot check certain folks or if we get whistleblower tips, we go in and look at folks about allegations of improprieties, other things like that. So if you want to get with me right afterwards um, and, and give me the name, more than happy to go back and look and see what records we have about that organization. One of the other things, let me bring up, we run into certain situations where governmental entities, cities or counties will create districts they're in charge of appointing board members to those districts. From our perspective, they're technically responsible for overseeing what's going on and making sure those districts don't run off the rails. And sometimes those governmental entities forget about that. Uh, in the one case with the water district we were talking about, um, 
In essence, some of those board members have been there for 20 years and the council had forgotten that they were appointing folks. And so you run into di different situations. So we run into some counties where they forget about all the, uh, all the districts they create within the county, even though they're responsible. I know one county is going through right now all the districts they have, finding all the organizational documents and other things like that so they can, and, and the appointment terms, so they can make sure they have better understanding and control over which entities they have, which ones they're responsible for, what's the term for appointments, so they can make sure they're actively appointing folks. I've talked with the uh, district association uh, person, and while state law has said, you know, four years or until replaced, the until replaced was supposed to be something like three to six months. It was not supposed to be like forever until they die and stuff. So there's a question, yes sir. Okay, so this is a good question. There are different types of audits. Now what you're talking about most likely is you have uh, a private CPA firm doing your financial statement audit. Your financial statement audit, the purpose of that is to issue an opinion on your financial statements that they fairly represent the financial position of your organization. Now going back to Utah Communications Authority, I told you about the $800,000 stolen over 10 years. Technically their audit that said that financial statement is materially correct was appropriate. Even though that much money was stolen, it was immaterial in terms of what was, what was reported on the financial statements. And so while the financial statement audit may come back clean, you may have other problems in your organization and certain risks that you want to make sure you're following up on and stuff like that. So don't just assume the financial statement audit will deal with that. Oftentimes they are not designed to detect fraud. They're, de they're designed to detect material fraud, but materiality is something that causes someone to alter their decision making behavior because of what's taking place. And so, so in that irrigation district, if they were large enough to have been audited, 15% of their budget would have been material. But if you're dealing with that U UCA and you're talking about you know, half a percent or one percent, largely that would have been immaterial. The other dynamic was she was reporting the expenditures, they just were not legitimate expenditures, but they're still being reported as expenditures within the budget. And so you need to be aware of the other risks in your organization, the policies and procedures around that. Yes sir, in the back. Yeah, so in my office the way we handle those type of things is the employee charges it to their personal card. Uh, you know, we buy the airline ticket with the company card, so my admin purchases the, the airline, but they put their hotel and their meals on their personal card and then they submit for reimbursement. So I know some that have frequent travel will have a travel card, but when it's infrequent, like once or twice a year, we recommend you just let them put it on. The other thing we tell folks is, is do reimburse in a timely manner. These days, oftentimes, an employee can get reimbursed within, you know, three to seven days. So they're likely not going to hit their credit card statement within that period of time. Uh, yes, sir. So the question is, as an elected official, how is he supposed to know what an audit covers? How many here have heard the old saying, let people think you're a fool, open your mouth and remove all doubt? Unfortunately, too often that's the situation we all feel like we're in when we don't know something. Uh, we actually, uh, shortly into my uh, first term, we had a, a county government that was having some serious financial issues. Uh, we went in there to meet with them and, and basically gave them the message of you need to fix this problem. And they were, they were weeks away from not knowing whether they can meet payroll for their organization. Well, it turns out their auditor was flagging certain concerns for them, but they did not understand what the auditor was saying to them. And so we've been trying to work with the auditors to say, if your client doesn't understand what you're saying, you didn't really communicate with them. But the other thing is we're trying to get elected officials and administrative folks, ask questions. Don't worry about thinking that you're a fool. Ask some questions to better understand, okay, so what all does this audit cover? What, what does it mean? Did you, what did you look at? What should we be looking at that you didn't look at so you can get a better understanding? Because when it comes to our perspective, we talk about financial statement audits, we talk about compliance audits, we talk about performance audits, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to make sure you're asking your auditors questions. You also want to make sure you're asking your finance officials questions. And in, depending on your organizations, I would recommend you're, you're making sure you're getting reports and other things to better understand kind of what's, what's the dynamic that's taking place. Okay, so GFOA has uh, good materials. Also, if you go to my website, training.auditor.utah.gov, we have some online video training classes. 
We also, for small entities that don't receive audits, we have a self-check questionnaire. So you may want to look at that, see what questions we have them ask in those situations, and see if you want to apply some of those to your larger organizations so you can better understand what's going on. So the question is, how do you deal with it if you find something? How do you, how do you work through that? Now, now, just a quote that my kids hate. It's from Ronald Reagan. It's trust but verify. And too often when you go into your organizations and you start asking questions, what's the first thing people say? Don't, don't you trust me? Don't you trust me? Are you, they, they're, they're highly offended. Is that you being an answer, John? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have given that answer many times. And I would say the folks that fund them need to do a better job of holding them accountable. Let me get back to your question, but on the UTA question, uh, I don't know how many know Councilman Snowgrove from Salt Lake County. He came to me, was concerned about what UTA was saying about closed door meetings and other things like that, and he didn't think that was appropriate. And he asked what state law said in regards to the transit funding that flowed from counties to UTA, because it's the counties that fund UTA as well as the federal government. Um, and I have complained for years that those counties need to step up and hold, in that case, UTA more responsible for how that money is being spent. Because they're the ones that have the fiduciary responsibility back to their taxpayers, because they're the ones that levy the tax and pay the money to UTA for services. And so in this case, Councilman Snowgrove said, so what has state law said? And I said, state law does not say when you have to pay the money to them. You have to pay it to the transit agency, but does not say when. So if you want to slow roll it and you want to sit on it for a period of time to get them into compliance, that is perfectly fine, but don't go spend it on something else that's not allowed by law. And so he, he threatened, didn't do it at the end of the day because they changed some of the stuff they were doing, but that was his threat. But at the end of the day, if you're responsible for the money, you need to make sure you're holding people accountable for that money. Yes, I trust you, but I need to verify what's going on. Now, sometimes within your organization, you can raise that concerns and people will start to understand. Um, sometimes, for example, uh, I gave the example of the policies there in Catesville. I flagged to the mayor, I don't think you need the state auditor to come look at this. I think you guys can handle it within your organization. Here's, here's questions to ask. Here's ways to go about doing it, but you guys can go handle it. But sometimes we have situations that have to bubble up to us. And we'll pick a unified fire authority. Uh, there was clearly a long history of, of some concerns on the part of a few board members, but the other board members not really recognizing the severity of some of the complaints and ultimately, it took us doing an audit for the entire board to fully grasp the magnitude of the concerns that were taking place there. And so sometimes, sometimes uh, it's, it's flagging the concern for us. And sometimes us just asking some questions starts to get folks focused on fixing the problems. Sometimes folks are in denial, and we have to come in and, and uncover everything and point out what we found. And it's our job to point out what we see and how we, how we found it. And sometimes it's, it's pretty straightforward for us to do it. Uh, like it was down in Kane County, and some organizations, it's much more complex. But within an organization, part of the dynamic you're dealing with, if you're on a council, some folks will feel offended. Well, you're, you, we've trusted so and so for 20 years, and 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 how could you question their integrity? But the interesting thing, if you if you study about ethics, who do you think is your greatest ethical risk in an organization? Your most loyal employee? or the employee that's not committed to your organization. <laughs> the interesting thing is it's your most loyal. Your most loyal employee wants to see your organization successful, and they want to be successful with you. And they are the ones, unfortunately, that will start to look the other way when it comes to certain things because in the long run, they think they're helping the organization. The other thing is you're not going to put somebody you don't trust over your finances you're going to put people that you trust over your finances. So just by the very nature, you're putting people you trust into those situations. And I tell folks, there but for the grace of God, go each one of us. Because sometimes folks are quick to say, I would never do that. That would never happen to me. Um, I deal with a lot of folks that have professional licensing. And I can't tell you the number of times when I ask them, what would you do if you had a supervisor ask you to do something unethical or illegal? Oh, I would never do that. I would never do that. But I promise you, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you've got a serious family illness or some other pressure going on and, and your kid's going to die but for $100,000 or something like that, in the wrong circumstances for the wrong amount of money, each one of us 
is subject to doing something that we would never envision ourselves doing. And we have to, we have, to have the humility to understand the risk that we have ourselves and not just think that applies to somebody else. Roger, did you have anything you want? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can go to hotline.utah.gov. Hotline.utah.gov. You can submit a form online. You can call the uh, 800 number and let us know about it. And, and sometimes we will do that. Sometimes, depending on the issue, we will turn it over to somebody else if we think they can uh, review that. You know, let's suppose it's dealing with something with a, a school. We might turn it over to the state office of education and the state board's audit director. It all depends on the nature. But yes, you can contact us. And with that, I'm being told my time is up. It's been a pleasure to visit with you. I hope this has been insightful. I know that I'm supposed to visit with some folks. I've got some office hours from 2.30 to 3. But it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for your service to your communities and to the state.